afternoon and welcome to our NISIS webinar today, North Carolina Teacher Evaluation, Completing the Peer Observation. At the bottom of your screen, you see a link to our NISIS Google site where you can find updated information and supporting resources for your work using NISIS. And in green below, you have a link to the presentation for today. My name is Kimberly Simmons. I'm the NISIS coordinator. Uh, I'm joined today by, with Cami Naren, our NISIS education product consultant. Hi, Cami. Thanks for joining us. Hi, Kim. Glad to be here. Uh, Cami, can you put the links to the presentation in the chat for us today? Um, yes, let me know where I was. Thanks. Our webinar training norms for today, we ask that you minimize your outside distractions, be attentive and participate. Please notify the presenter if you are having technical difficulties. Use the chat on your dashboard to ask questions or notify the presenter if you are having technical difficulties. And please mute your microphone and video is not needed today. You will receive a follow-up email. It's scheduled for 24 to 48 hours after the end of the webinar. Within this email, you will receive a certificate of completion. Once you complete the NISIS feedback survey, you will receive a certificate of completion. You'll also receive a link to a recording of the webinar and links to resources discussed during the webinar. Also, we will include answers to any questions remaining from the webinar or ask afterwards. So our webinar outcomes for today, we're going to take a look at the five W's of peer observations. Who are peer observers? What are peer observations? When should peer observations happen? Where do peer observations occur? In, including the post-observation, that means where should they take place? And why are peer observations important? Also, we'll take a brief refresh on how to complete the peer observation, remembering that the goal is always growth. And we'll also do a refresh with ways to ensure accurate and reliable feedback during our post-observation conversations. So the North Carolina Evaluation Manual um, is the best resource for evaluating teachers and the best resource to always use. Throughout the presentation today, I will identify page numbers from the manual where information may be found. The process manual is reflective of the North Carolina policies for teacher evaluation. To the left is the teacher evaluation process one pager found on page 21 of the process manual. And this resource allows you to see the four step process in its entirety. Uh, notice that step one begins in green on the top left and circles around clockwise. The yellow arrows that you see identify the peer role within the process. So shaded in green, you see step one, training and orientation, and component one, training states, before participating in the evaluation process, all teachers, principals, and peer evaluators must complete training on the evaluation process. So here in step one training, the peer is mentioned specifically. And this takes us to our first question. Who are our peer observers? So page five of the teacher evaluation manual has a definition of the peer, a teacher who has been trained on the North Carolina teacher evaluation process. So the principal has the opportunity here to be very purposeful in choosing the right peer teacher to provide support to a teacher with less than three years experience. To be successful, Peer observers must have expertise in teaching and be willing to have an impact on the development of a new teacher. Choosing the right peer can be one of the most important assignments a principal makes in the support and retention of a new teacher. So now skipping over to step three, component six, observation, the peer is identified again to complete a formal observation of a teacher with less than three years experience, meaning on the comprehensive evaluation cycle. So what are peer observations? The peer observation involves teachers observing each other's practice and learning from one another, focusing on teachers' individual needs and the opportunity 
to both learn from others' practice and offer constructive feedback to their peers. Peer observation aims to support the sharing of practice and to build awareness about the impact of one's teaching practice in order to affect change. Remember that peer observation is a structured way of teachers working together to refine and improve their practice and can support teachers to enhance student learning when situated in a broader culture of collaboration in your school. Mutual trust and respect, is those are crucial components of the relationship between the peer observer and the teacher being observed. And within the evaluation process, the peer observation is another opportunity for evidence to be collected to support teacher growth. So this chart provides the requirements for each cycle listed on the left side, and the peer observation is circled in red. Note that the peer observation has the same weight towards the end of the year element ratings as any other observation. This is important to note for a peer you have influence and impact on the rating outcomes of the teacher based on what descriptors that you mark during the peer formal observation. To further understand observations, consider the year-long evaluation process as a series of formative assessments or observations. During observations, data is collected using the rubric. The misconception that teachers are evaluated and rated numerous times during the year has burdened the focus of growth intended for the process. Everyone is evaluated annually at the end of the school year, at which time ratings are assigned for each standard. But for our peer observation, remember it's just one collection of data to inform the evaluation at the end of the year. So do I have any questions up to this point, Cami? No questions right now, Kim. Okay, thank you. So here's our first refresh, and that is how to complete the peer observation, remembering that the goal is always growth. When marking the rubric during an observation, the peer observer should mark what they see and what they know. Remember, that to know something about a teacher, you must have evidence of what you know. This can include conversations, products of learning, lesson plans, memos. The potential evidence list is long. Just remember that you cannot mark a descriptor without answering the question, how do I know this about the teacher? Never assume, justify with your evidence. It is also important to understand the element context and rating levels to mark the rubric correctly. It is crucial to read the element description, as you see in red. Understanding the element provides context for the descriptors. This element description should be the lens you use to interpret the descriptors within the rubric. And while we do not rate teachers during observations, we can still use the rating categories related located at the top of the rubric columns to better understand the rubric. 90% of the rubric falls into a pattern of progressive development of knowledge, action, interaction, and extension. As you see on the rubric, descriptors under the developing rating category are relative to the knowledge of the teacher. Do you know it? Proficient descriptors relate to action. Do you show it? Accomplished is about interaction. Is it visible in the actions of your students? And in the distinguished column, the descriptors relate to extension. Is it visible beyond the instructional space of your classroom? So I recommend that you spend some time understanding the rubric, looking for patterns of progression, along with areas that seem isolated. Also, remember to use the questions document that I will review for you later in the presentation. The questions document will provide clarification into what the element is really about. So here, let's look at the descriptors to see if they align with the progression development of knowledge action, interaction, and extension. 
And remember, this would be a great talking point. This slide would be a great talking point for a PLC or a curriculum meeting. So let's take a look at the first descriptor under developing, which states understands developmental levels of students and recognizes the need to differentiate instruction. The verb understands does relate directly back to the knowledge of the teacher. Progressing across to the proficient category, which is action, understands developmental levels of students and appropriately differentiates instruction. An action is incorporated there with this descriptor. The second descriptor assesses resources needed to address strengths and weaknesses of students. Again, there is an action involved. Progressing across to accomplished, interaction, we'll just take a look at a couple more descriptors. The top descriptor says, identifies appropriate developmental levels of students and consistently and appropriately differentiates instruction. That discusses the interaction between the student and the teacher. And extension encourages and guides colleagues to adapt instruction to align with students' developmental levels. This work, this descriptor, references in extension, something happening outside of the walls of the classroom. So I just wanted to point out, I'm sure you've already noticed this by this time of the year, but just to point out and uh, uh, so that you can have some context for the change, the new rubric rating title descriptors for NESIS, self-assessments, observations, and summary evaluations includes these actions, which relate to the rating categories. Developing, you see within the online tool, that you will have knowledge in parentheses out beside of the developing rating category. The same for proficient with action, accomplished, interaction, and distinguished for extension. So marking the rubric during observations. This information can be found on page 34 of the process manual. The principal or observer in this reference, we mean the peer, will complete the rubric for evaluating North Carolina teachers during each observation. So a check in the first column labeled observation means that the evaluator should be able to observe the items in that row during the routine observation. The observer checks descriptors observed during the lesson and considers evidence of additional performance responsibilities demonstrated by the teacher. In a previous slide, it was, what did you see and what do you know? Observers should mark what they see and what they know. So for example, if you know this teacher plans her lessons based on numerous assessment data because she shared the data with you during a conversation that you had earlier in the year, then you should be able to mark the descriptor stating, evaluate student progress using a variety of assessment data. I didn't observe the teacher analyzing the data, however, Based on our conversation and the data and analysis that she shared with me, I have evidence and reason to mark the descriptor. Again, what I see and what I know. So now let's look at the descriptor in the second column. Provides evidence of data-driven instruction throughout all classroom activities. This descriptor is not marked, even though the descriptor in the third column is marked. The descriptors progress across the rubric most of the time, but marking the, de the descriptors on the rubric does not have to progress across from right to left during an observation. Ideally, the rating descriptors would not exist on the self-assessment and the observation rubric. However, the, for whatever reason, these rating descriptors are maintained within our tool, and um, but during observations, we do not relate the ratings. So procedures for collecting teacher practice data throughout the year on the observation rubric differs from those required at the time of the summary ratings are being determined. So when we're completing the observation rubric, disregard all the labels that apply to the summary rating evaluation process 
Again, this includes the column headings, developing, proficient, accomplished, and distinguished. Um, these are only relevant at the time of the summary rating. Make sure that you check descriptors for actions that are observed during both the classroom observation and the observation cycle period. This includes all elements, not just those marked as visible during the observation. There is no obligation to a left to right progression within an element row. Check what you see and what you know to be true. And write detailed comments and feedback in the comment boxes. And check additional element descriptors if the post conversation discussion or artifacts weren't doing so. So you can gather data during the observation itself, and then you can also check additional descriptors during the post-observation conversation if more things come to light, if the teacher provides you with evidence and artifacts. So peer observation should occur after the first formal observation of the year. Uh, let's take a look at the question. I jumped right into what I was explaining. So when should the peer observations happen? They should occur after the first formal observation of the year. The beginning of the year components are in the red square that you see on the screen. And if you follow this chart, you see that the peer observation would be the last observation and post-conference. However, the peer observation may happen at any time after the first formal observation. Where do peer observations happen? Peer observations should occur in the teacher's classroom or where the lesson is being taught. And this year particularly, this could include an online platform. Post-observation conferences should occur in the teacher's classroom and other options to consider um, would be the online platform or the conference room. And we'll discuss that a little bit later as well when we discuss feedback. To kind of simplify here, if I observe a teacher uh, using an online platform, it's okay for me to have the post-observation conference with her as well on an online platform. As a result of the observations, we have component six, post-observation conference. The principal, and in this case, the peer observer, shall conduct a post-observation conference no later than 10 school days after each formal observation. The purpose of the post-observation conference is to discuss and document strengths and weaknesses on the rubric. Earlier in the presentation, I emphasized the purpose of evaluation. It's really about growth and improvement. The post-observation conference is at the heart of what we are working to accomplish, growth for teachers. The post-observation conference should focus on the evidence gathered during the observation. Teachers should have an opportunity to reflect on the observation as it relates to the rubric. Observers should follow on providing relevant feedback on marked descriptors and how to grow forward for improved practice. The language of the rubric should be used to enhance an accurate interpretation of the standards. The post-observation conference is a crucial part of the evaluation process. The meeting between the teacher and the observer provides an opportunity for strengthened communication that results in a plan of continued improvement for the teacher's practice. The post-observation conference should not include discussion of ratings. It should include discussion of teacher growth. So why are peer observations important? This brings us directly to the heart. Peer observations enable teachers to grow individually and collaborate on a shared understanding of effective classroom practice. It also strengthens teachers' leadership skills in giving and receiving feedback. Peer observations, including feedback and reflection, has a high impact on improving professional practice and can have significant impact on teacher growth, especially within the first few years. There is extensive research on using peer observations to support individual teachers, teams of teachers, and whole school instructional approach as well as making a positive contribution to the collective 
efficacy, and the educational culture of a school. Kim, okay, do you have time for a question? Yes, this is a great time. Okay. Um, the question is, how about when the teacher is teaching online and face-to-face? -face? You can choose between um, either of the formats to um, have the observation. If I had an opportunity to have a face-to-face -face observation, I would pr professionally, I would choose um, to have the um, direct face-to-face -face observation. But in some situations, if you wanted to collect that data, maybe this is a teacher that wants to teach online next year and you wanna gather um, their skills, you wanna document their skills, that would be fine. Um, it's really flexible and that is a local decision. Thank you, Kim. Okay. So let's refresh um, on what we know about feedback. Teachers want and deserve feedback that is accurate and unbiased to support their growth. So I mentioned a couple of these earlier, but let's review the best practices for observation feedback. When we consider the setting, uh, we have the classroom or the conference room. Also, use the language of the rubric, not ratings, when discussing performance. Focus on low inference data, remove your bias, and stay focused on the goal of the evaluation process, which is growth. And let's look just a little closer at each of these. So typically, the post-observation conference happens in the teacher's classroom. This location is comfortable for the teacher, and having the conversation where the observation actually occurred permits relativity to the actual observation. However, the conversation may be interrupted by students coming in to get items they forgot or teachers visiting the teacher to collaborate. So consider the amount of interruption that you may have based on the conversation that you'll be having and the feedback you'll be providing. You may wanna consider the conference room as a neutral space where interruptions will be limited. Next, the summary evaluation conference is the only time ratings should be discussed because that is the only time they should be given. The post observation following a peer observation should not include ratings. So let's talk about what the conference should include. Post observation conferences should take the language of the rubric to frame the discussion about the practice. And here is the questions document I mentioned earlier. This is a resource called Questions for Post-Observation Conference and Summative Evaluation. This questions document provides questions for teacher reflection using the language of the rubric. The questions are organized by standards one through five, and this tool helps to create a common understanding of the standards and the elements and what information will be collected from the observation. Now moving on to a focus on low inference data, which removes your bias. So I'd like for you to take just a moment and take a look at this picture and, tell, and just think to yourself, what are you observing in this picture? What are the details that you, are, that you can observe in this picture? So there's a lot that we could infer. For example, we could say that the teacher in this picture is creative or energetic or fun. However, we don't know for sure that that is the case. It could be that the students in this picture just woke up from a, from a nap and are taking a stretch. And remember that attitude and motivation shouldn't matter with regards to evaluation because being creative, energetic, and fun are describing the teacher's attitude or motivation. And those are not things that we can actually see or hear. You can't see or hear energetic. So I'd like you to take a different look now through a different lens. 
and, and name what low inference evidence that you can take from this picture. So we can see um, that the students have their arms raised, uh, the teacher standing with the students, the teacher is smiling and talking, maybe singing, the students are standing, their posters on the wall, the chart paper is blank. That is low inference evidence. You may even get more specific to say 11 of the 13 children are modeling what the teacher is doing. But that is low inference data to collect and to document on the rubric when possible. And when giving teachers few feedback, use low inference evidence collected from the classroom observation or your on-campus interactions and align it to the bullets on the rubric. So if we're looking at element 1A, teachers lead in their classroom, I've circled three descriptors at the bottom of the screen. And note that these are most likely to be, um, um, to appear during a observation. So what low inference classroom observation data should I be looking for with regards to standard one? And we're really thinking about these three descriptors. What, what would I want to see? Think to yourself, what do you need to see to, to check this box, which says establishes a safe and orderly classroom? What will that look like? Creates a classroom culture that empowers students to collaborate. What do you need to see in the classroom to check that descriptor? Or the last, under the distinguished category, empowers and encourages students to create and maintain a safe and supportive school and community environment. So low inference data may be um, the organization of the classroom, the interaction of the classroom, the discussions between the students in the classroom and results of those conversations or assignments from the classroom, all of those things could be used as evidence, low inference data, to help you document and mark these descriptors on the observation. The next, next best practice, stay focused on the goal of the, of the evaluation, which is always growth. I always try to share this caption whenever possible. I plug it into as, as many presentations as I can, and it relates directly back to standard two, adapts teaching for the benefit of students with special needs. You see a student in on the screen, you see a student in a wheelchair. He says, could you please shovel the ramp? The custodian or principal or teacher replies, all these other kids are waiting to use the stairs. When I get through shoveling them off, then I will clear the ramp for you. The student replies, but if you shovel the ramp, we can all get in. Clearing a path for people with special needs clears the path for everyone. We should always be looking for the best path, the best instruction that meets the needs of our students. Peer observations provide opportunities to share these best practices among teachers. Do I have any thoughts, questions, or ponderings as a result of the presentation today for peer observations? I don't see anybody in the chat right now. I don't know if you can see the chat, Kim. We had a couple answers while you were looking at the picture, but. Oh, okay. Somebody would comment that the teacher was modeling and leading the class in the activity. Yes. Um, okay. Somebody else posted they had noticed the class rules posted. Okay. Yes. 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 All of that is low inference data, which should inform um, the observation. Yes. And thank you for submitting those those responses. So, would you like to uh, discuss the Nisus resources, Cammy? 
Okay, um, yeah, we have uh, some new resources out, out there. Uh, we used to have from our educator support department, um, which has now changed to uh, a new educator support name, um, but the people that housed those courses that were on the RT3NC.org site um, is now at NCVPS, and so they are managing those courses for us, and there is a new link there at the top for their new site. So if you want some professional learning to take to earn credit, these are free and you do go through NESIS. Um, you can come out here and see what they've posted and then go into NESIS and search for the course and start start the course. And then down below, um, if you want some information about how to find PD in NESIS, uh, there's some links there, some um, help documents and a quick video out there. And then how to get to your transcript and your certificate once you finish the course, there's a list there. And I've also on the last link on our NESIS Google Information and Support site, um, I've updated the spreadsheet there of all the courses that are published out on our NESIS uh, catalog of PD. Okay, thank you, Tammy. Yeah. So um, there was another question that was submitted um, and it states, what kind of artifacts do you need to add for a peer observation? So just remember that um, the intensity around the peer observation is not um, the same as the observation by your principal or a designee. Um, so the burden of artifacts is not as heavy uh, as it would be with one of those with one of those observations. But the type of artifacts for a peer observation may be um, if the next day after the observation, which where if you were a peer where you observe, let's say the lesson was wrapped up and there was a product of learning, that's an artifact that the teacher may want to share with you during the post observation conversation. Um, I would focus for the peer observation more on any artifacts that's related to that observation, um, which occurred, the 40 minute observation, which occurred. I would limit it. Now, on the summative evaluation at the end of the year, or for some of the observations, like I mentioned before, with a principal, the burden of artifacts and evidence may be heavier. That is one of the slight differences between a peer observation and, and the other observations. But um, I would just focus on any artifacts or evidence um, from the actual 40 minute formal observation. I hope that answers your question. On the screen, you, you see the link to the NESIS Google site I uh, mentioned earlier. Again, this is uh, updated information and resources to support your work using NESIS. Here we have some contact information. And Cami, I, again, would you like to chime in about who should be using this um, contact information? Okay, so if you're having issues in the NISA system, there is a designated person uh, that can um, open a ticket with DPI if it can't be fixed at the local level. So find out who that person is in your district, and then they can call this number here or use the link on this site um, to open a ticket with NCDPI. And we have an awesome tier one team that troubleshoots our NISA tickets. We usually have very few NISA tickets. Some of our local districts are very good about troubleshooting, um, but if they do need to open a ticket, this is the information they need. Perfect, thank you. Again, as a reminder, you will receive a follow-up email um, one to two days after the webinar today, so please keep an eye out for that so you can complete your feedback survey and receive your certificate of completion and Again, as I would like one comment on that, Kim. Okay, uh, sure. I am setting up that flow right now so that you can get that certificate. So please um, give me just a minute to complete that, and hopefully it's working. If not, if it doesn't work right now, the next five minutes, I will get that out in the follow up email. Okay, all right. Thank you, Cammie. Thank you. Our contact information is on the screen. Um, Please reach out to Cami or I if you have um, questions. 
or issues regarding the online tool. I'm focused more about process, um, professional development, implementation, policy. Cami is focused more on the technical end and the online tool. So if uh, you have questions about either, please um, reach out to us so we can support your work using NESIS. And we will stay on the line for just a couple more minutes. Again, thank you for joining us today. If there are more specific questions that you have regarding the peer observation, please submit those to me or send those to me um, within the next day, uh, or if you think of any, and I'll try to include those in the follow-up email. Um, thank you again for joining us, and I hope you have a great evening. Thank you. I do see a couple of questions coming in, so thank you. Um, so, okay. Kim White, uh, said, I see you're at a charter school and you need some cleanup in NISIS. Um, I'll send you my link to get on an office call and um, we'll work on that. The slides, somebody's asking when they will be available. We did put a link in the chat here. Um, and we'll get that posted out in the follow up email as well. Um, but the slides are available now and we'll get those out to you. And let's see if there's any other. Um, thank you all for attending today. I think I did um, get the feedback survey to where it should work. Uh, so please try that out and then just email uh, me, cami.nearin at, at dpi.nc.gov. And um, if it's not working, then I'll check it again. So thank you guys for attending today. Thank you, Kim. This is very important. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a good evening.